Good day. We're going to talk today about political theology, and I'm here with Dr. Steve Studebaker. He's the Associate Professor of Systematic and Historical Theology at McMaster Divinity College in Hamilton, Ontario. And I'm Dr. Andrew Gabriel from Horizon College and Seminary and andrewkgabriel.com. Dr. Studebaker is the author of a number of books, including writing on uh, Pentecostal theology. His most recent book is A Pentecostal Political Theology, uh, and that's the discussion uh, that we'll have today. So briefly, uh, Steve, could you tell us what is political theology exactly? Yeah, I think fundamentally political theology is the attempt to understand political or Christian uh, political engagement in this world with uh, theological categories in terms of uh, theological terms. What does it mean theologically for Christians to be engaged in politics, social issue, cultural issues? What sort of categories from the Christian tradition and theology would help us to understand and inform uh, our uh, activity in, in the world of politics? Right. So when you say politics, you don't just mean like working at the legislature, or becoming a politician. No, no, and it, no. And I think probably most most people involved with political theology are not professional politicians. Uh, they're Christian theologians, perhaps sociologists, Christian thinkers in a general sense who are trying to articulate uh, what it means for Christians uh, to be engaged in social, cultural, and political issues. Right. And uh, what are some of the key emphases in political theology today? Yeah, two basic orientations or types of questions that, that political theologians think about. One is the Christian Christians or the church's relationship to the state, to society, to culture, sort of mm -hmm. in broad terms. Right. And then the second sort of basic set of or type of question is to ask would be particular issues. What does Christian theology, Christian thinking, Christian worldview bring to particular issues and questions that are that society is facing. And that could be things like you know, transgender issues, mm -hmm. um, cannabis legalization, immigration, okay. questions of that sort. Right. And how have Pentecostals contributed to political theology? What What's their sort of unique perspective in all of this? Well, in, in terms of academic theology, it's fairly new. Amos Young uh, would be an example. Um, I've written, you know, written a book on political theology. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new sort of area for uh, uh, Pentecostals to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. But I think there is uh, intrinsic to uh, the Pentecostal experience a, pen a contribution to uh, political theology, particularly the Pentecostal holistic experience of grace. So what do you mean by holistic experience of well, grace? Well, holistic means that uh, that, that, the, that the spirit of Pentecost, that the way Pentecostals experience redemption is not simply um, an add-on of sort of a spirituality. So mm -hmm. it, it, now, it, obviously it has charismatic gifts and, and that sort of element to it, but right. Pentecostals from the beginning, whether it was the interracial, gender sort of transcending experiences of Azusa or the later uh, sort of um, social mobility that Pentecostals experience, both at an individual and at denominational levels, those are uh, implicate or at least indicate that the Pentecostal experience of grace has material and concrete um, consequences for life, mm -hmm. um, not simply adding on a spiritual experience. Okay. In your own writings on Pentecostal political theology, what, what is your unique emphasis that you're bringing to the table? Yeah, I, what I want to develop based on, on the Pentecostal experience of grace uh, and the biblical sort of narrative of the spirit of Pentecost is to see our uh, to see life in the city which is inclusive of all the range of human experiences and culture and creation as a life in the spirit right. so life in the city is life in the spirit right and when you say life in the city that includes people who are living in rural parts of idaho and saskatchewan as well it does right yeah yeah it's not i'm not calling for sort of a everybody moved to a, you know sort of an right. urban sort of uh, mega city mm -hmm. Um, life in the city is simply a, a metaphor, which I take from scripture, the New Jerusalem. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so a city is the most sophisticated, or it's a symbol of the most sophisticated organization of, of, of human society, of human culture, and all the activities, insofar as they're not sinful, mm -hmm. that, take, that, that take place within, within human society. So yeah, that would include uh, everything from a, a rural, small town to a large, you know, sort of mega city like Toronto. Right. And so how, how does your perspective on political theology, how does that compare to uh, the way that other people are thinking about, uh, well, other Christians are thinking about life in the world? Yeah, so I think um, most of the popular options today 
that, that, that deal in political theology do not really provide us with a, a positive way of understanding our life in the city. Mm -hmm. At best, they are ambivalent. Usually, they, they see life in the city, that our, our life in this world is we're aliens, we're sojourners, we're pilgrims on our way to right. our heaven. So we don't belong here. Kind of thing. No, not right. ultimately. This is not our home. Right. Heaven is our home. Right. Our, we're, it's a far off country where we're heading. The kingdom, right. We're waiting for the kingdom of God. And mm -hmm. so we have to hold this world tenuously. This is Babylon. We can't, you know, we, can, you know, we, just, we have to use it. If we, usually if we have a sense of that there's some positive element to, to our activity in, in this world. It's usually for functional, pragmatic reasons, you know, to sustain the body. But in terms of really seeing this world as a place of Christian identity, uh, uh, no, it's, they, don't offer, they don't offer that. Right, and what are a couple of the other ways that people are thinking about? Yeah, so um, one would be take back the culture for God Christians, sort of reconquist okay. to Christians. Um, and the, the problem with that is they think they can baptize Babylon. They can't. Mm -hmm. um, the other forms are forms of what I call ghetto Christianity. Okay. Um, one is uh, 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 club Christianity is probably the most popular, and that, that, that's the sort of the big box Walmart style church mm -hmm. um, that offers a, you know a whole array of consumable items for Christians. They're content with secularization. They're happy to serve as the cloister of individual spirituality and piety. Uh, the second one, which is increasingly uh, popular, especially among progressive Christians, progressive evangelicals, is Margins Christianity. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the collapse of Christendom, rejoice at it, uh, and believe that the only real authentic place to live the Christian life is on the edge of empire, to subvert empire. So right. no real sense that the, the larger world about us is a place of positive Christian involvement. Right, so not, um, not the political engagement that you're seeking. No, no. It's, it, they see, it sees, the, sees the mainstream society uh, as, as an evil empire. Okay. Right? And, and so it's shot full with, with, with corruption and exploitation of people. And the only thing we can do is to sort of question it and subvert it. So the other, part, the other form is bunker Christianity, which is sort of a, you know, uh, sees the, the mainstream society as you know secularized and godless and heathen and mm -hmm. multicultural and it's all evil and so we have to retreat to the bunker of the church, mm -hmm. the citadel of, of, of the church, and you know try to retain our Christian identity there. Maybe once in a while go out and you know do some witnessing and you know stuff like that, but then retreat back to the to the safety of the church. So again, your proposal is unique in comparison to these how. Yeah, so my, what I argue is that um, there is a continuity between our life in this world, and that includes the life of the city, again, insofar as it's not sinful, and the everlasting kingdom. So typically, we'll look in Scripture and see the two cities of Babylon and the New, New Jerusalem. And obviously, there's discontinuity between those two cities. Mm -hmm. um, but the discontinuity of our life with Babylon is not, not Babylon as such as, as the life of the city, but the way of Babylon, the way of sin. We mm -hmm. don't have continuity with that. Right. But the things that take place in Babylon, the things that human beings do within Babylon, all the cultural activity from leisure to entertainment and society and politics, those things are not intrinsically evil. Those things are efforts of fallen human beings endeavoring to embody their spirit-breathed life. And Revelation says, not simply that, that Babylon is replaced, but it says the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. It will become it will be renewed, not obliterated. And that's why at, in, at the end of the book of Revelation, you don't have a, a, a church coming down from, from, from God to the new heaven and the new, to the new earth, but you have a city, mm -hmm. a new Jerusalem. And so the everlasting kingdom has a city in its center. And not just one city, but there are multiple cities. If it says the kings of the world will come to that city to give their adoration and their honor to Christ. So... The everlasting kingdom is a place that is much like the world in which we live in, except mm -hmm. that it's been, it's been healed of the stain and the corruption of sin. Mm -hmm. But the activities of, of, of human cultural civilization, social activity, politics, all of those things will be part of it, but they will be redeemed. Mm -hmm. So for the average Christian, what difference does this make, this way of thinking about engaging with the world? And so I think what, what, what I want to contribute uh, for, in terms of practical terms is to provide the imaginative space uh, for Christians to see all of their life as part of their life with God. Mm. It's not simply their church stuff. Their ch yes, right. church is part of, it, it's that specific uh, uh, area of our life that is directly related to God and focused on God and worship of God, but every other thing that we do is also like that, whether it's volunteering for our, our kids' sports team or your 
whatever you're doing in terms of leisure, uh, your business, your profession, your, your extracurricular activities, again, insofar as they're not sinful, right? There's things in life that are intrinsically sinful. Right. But most of the things that we do, even when they're tainted and corrupted by our fallenness, are not intrinsically bad things. They're good things. They're things that are our efforts to bring to concrete material uh, realization our spirit breathe life. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Dr. Studebaker. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching.